Hello and welcome back from the networking break. This is Tom Bechtold, your host from Secure World Digital. Up next, we have Cyber Intel Debrief. This time we're getting in the deep dive with artificial intelligence. And I want to say thank you to uh, our, our good buddies, uh, Cedric Layton, Colonel of the United States Air Force, co-founder and partner at Cyforex and CNN military analyst. Uh, grateful to have you here, along with Vijay Viswanathan. He's the co-founder and partner over at Cyforex, as well as managing director at Torque and senior external advisor at Bain & Company. Gentlemen, you guys have a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to let you do the thing that you do best, so please. Uh, brief us. Well, thanks so much, Tom. It's always great to to be with you and uh, and uh, you know VJ and I have put a lot of thought into what we're going to do here for AI. And so we we thought we'd started uh, traditionally with our global Intel debrief. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and then VJ is going to talk about some more specific technical things and some of the aspects that uh, we can both handle in. Uh, in the way that uh, you know would make uh, your enterprise work a little bit better. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll uh, hit the highlights from an intelligence perspective uh, as we get into what AI can actually mean in terms of the global picture. So, from this standpoint, we have from a real big thirty thousand foot level. There's a new anti-West, anti-U.S. alliance that is forming, and it's going to have major impact on not only how we work as a nation, but also uh, on cybersecurity, and then more specifically on the development of artificial intelligence. I'll talk a little bit about what that alliance is and who's a part of that and what their goals are. And then we'll also talk about cyber attacks that are based on AI and then some AI-based kinetic attacks, and then what could possibly go wrong with AI kinetic attacks. So this new anti-US, anti-West alliance that's uh, being created is one in which there's a transference between these nations of technologies and skills. Also, they're sharing such things as the development of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons, drones, which we see uh, being used in the Ukraine war, uh, and munitions, munitions developments in terms of what uh, is actually being used in terms of the kinetic impact, as well as some of the things that are going on in other areas. The other thing that they're looking at in this alliance, this grouping of nations, is they realize that, especially the top two nations in this alliance, they realize that AI is critical to overcoming U.S. and Western advantages. So what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to turn the technology that is resident in AI and that AI uh, actually in some ways makes possible, they're going to try to turn that technology to their advantage and to the ultimate disadvantage of the Western powers. They are absolutely challenging the global world order and their idea is to create a new balance of power. So who exactly are these nations? Well, welcome to the latest rogues gallery. Uh, in this case, we're talking about Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. So here you see pictured Vladimir Putin with Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin with Kim Jong-un, Xi Jinping with Kim Jong-un, and then uh, Xi Jinping with uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, the uh, de facto supreme leader of Ir the Islamic Republic of Iran. So these groupings are based on a series of shared interests. The fact that uh, these countries to varying degrees are sanctioned uh, by Western nations and allied nations. And basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a completely different system, completely different global order than the one that uh, has existed you can basically say since the end of World War II, and certainly, more importantly, its iteration after the end of the Cold War. Uh, so whether or not this is going to be the beginning of a new Cold War, many people think it, it kind of isn't. I'm basically in that camp. Or if it's going to be something a little bit different, uh, it will still be a major threat to the Western alliances and, frankly, to our way of life. And that makes things very interesting from several different perspectives because there are several different 
uh, groups that are active in this arena. Uh, and here I have some of them listed. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they, you, of course, we always have a code name for everything. Uh, but in this particular case, this anti-US, anti-Western alliance is bearing some fruit within the artificial intelligence arena. And uh, we take a look at some of the groupings here, such as Emerald Sleet, which is from North Korea. Basically, it uses uh, large language models to create uh, spear phishing attacks. And it also, uh, it uh, uses scripting to increase, to help increase the velocity of, of these attacks. And we turn to Iran, and there's uh, something known as Crimson Sandstorm. Uh, in the case of Crimson Sandstorm, they generate code that avoids detection. And what it does try to do is it tries to disable security. Uh, so the types of malware that is developed that are developed in this particular case uh, really can play havoc with the kinds of systems that we're used to having. And this will portend a revolution in the cybersecurity industry. Then we turn to Russia, and we have Forest Blizzard, which is also known as Fancy Bear or APT28. Uh, the idea here is that uh, the folks at Forest Blizzard generate scripts to manipulate files and automate attacks. Again, a very important aspect of this. And then finally, I added Vault Typhoon. I've spoken about Vault Typhoon before. This is from China. But basically, what we're talking about here is a major series of attacks against the infrastructure, the critical infrastructure of the United States and allied partners. This first started in Guam and uh, then spread out throughout the Western Pacific, including U.S. bases in the Western Pacific. And the basic idea here is Vault Typhoon uses living off the land techniques where the malware is resident on uh, the target system and then basically obfuscates the logs and goes in there and manipulates things without you knowing that that is happening. And it, again, it detects that critical infrastructure that we depend on so, so much. So AI-based cyber attacks are now the focus of the U.S. intelligence and law enforcement communities. For example, the FBI has publicly stated that China is targeting U.S. power plants and, of course, the associated power grid, plus water treatment plants, transportation systems, and other parts of our critical infrastructure. And the reason they're doing this is, uh, you know, number one, reconnaissance. So that's one of the traditional attack vectors within uh, this uh, this in essence, this this uh, entity of, of attacks. And what we're looking at here is they're doing reconnaissance at first, but they're also laying the groundwork to mount, to conduct cyber attacks should the need arise, should, as we say in the military, the balloon go up. In other words, that hostilities commence or that we're in a state of near hostility between the United States and China, for example, or any number of other scenarios. At MIT, uh, one of their labs has created simulations which actually show motors, pumps, valves, and gauges uh, that they can be manipulated. And in certain cases, these pumps, motors, valves, and gauges can be made to explode. Given the right prompts, uh, they can destroy industrial control systems, these, these AI vectored attacks. And then one of the key things to remember, this kind of gets to the threshold of what one does from a national political perspective or a national command authority perspective. Does an attack like this on physical infrastructure, does that constitute an act of war? That is the kind of thing that uh, we are faced with here. So it could not only tax our technology and our ability uh, to in essence, prevent these attacks and our ability to withstand these attacks, in other words, our resiliency, but it will also tax our legal structures and our ability to respond legally and organizationally to these kinds of attacks. And that part holds true not only for government institutions, but also for the private sector as well. And then you have to ask the question, in the case of, of Volt Typhoon and attacks like it, is Volt Typhoon a precursor to an act of war? And one can make the argument that, in fact, Wall Typhoon is exactly that. So AI-based kinetic attacks uh, come in several different flavors. And one of the things that has happened is uh, countries around the world are looking at how artificial intelligence can be used not just in the cyber realm, 
but also in the physical realm. So this is where the kinetic attacks come in. So, uh, for example, the European Union is sponsoring an effort called Kinetics, uh, which is an effort to understand how artificial intelligence can impact attacks in the physical world. Uh, basically, what they're doing is they're trying to conduct R&D. These are universities within the European Union. Uh, to determine how better to protect the physical environment. So in essence, these are the good guys trying to respond to attacks from outside that could alter the physical environment in many different ways. Now, there are four different types of attacks as defined by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, the first one of these is called evasion. And so basically what this is, it's running malware and security software against each other so that the malware then learns how it is detected. So this is critical. Have the malware learning exactly how it can be detected allows the malware to live much longer on a target system. It can do things like change road signs, for example. So a stop sign becomes a speed limit sign or uh, you know, a caution sign becomes uh, you know, no speed limit in this particular zone. Uh, that can change how self-driving vehicles respond uh, to those prompts and could result in a lot of not only uh, chaos on the roadways, but potentially death and, uh, and injury as well. The other uh, element here is poisoning. So what is poisoning? Poisoning is the introduction of corrupted data. Uh, usually this occurs within the training phase of an AI system. So when the AI system is learning how to behave, introducing poison data into it is basically introducing corrupted data and that then allows the system to operate in a very very bad way potentially and that could also have an impact the third element uh, the third attack element is called privacy and basically what they're talking about here is reverse engineering the ai model to find weak spots and engage potentially in, in inappropriate behaviors uh, in essence, it's, it's really difficult for a system that's been targeted through a privacy attack for it to unlearn these kinds of behaviors. And that, of course, will compound the difficulty of trying to fix the kinds of problems that are instituted in, this, in a case like this. And then the fourth and final uh, type of attack using AI in the kinetic sense is abuse. And that inserts incorrect info into a source uh, like, for example, a web page. Uh, the AI absorbs the info, this type of information, and even though it comes from a legitimate source, like let's say a legitimate mainstream news source, that information is then potentially compromised because it is manipulated and false data is entered into that system. So that's currently how NIST defines these four types of attacks, evasion, poisoning, privacy, and abuse. And those attacks I can basically serve as a way in which to get into our heads uh, in terms of the information that we're presented with, uh, the way in which we respond to attacks, and the kinds of things that really become important in a case of a major attack like this. So that clearly indicates that a lot of things could possibly go wrong. And so although it's you know in the primitive stages of what I would call the artificial intelligence uh, revolution. I, one of the things that we have to look at is how things can go very, very badly wrong uh, during an AI-based kinetic attack. So as an example, we're going to use the drone strike, the Israeli drone strike, on the World Central Kitchen Convoy in Gaza. Uh, the Israelis used an automated targeting process. This attack happened back in April and seven World Central Kitchen aid workers from different nations were killed in that attack. That automated targeting process that the Israelis had, uh, because they didn't control it very well, resulted in a massive failure and a massive misidentification of the convoy vehicles, uh, mistaking people who were aid workers for Hamas fighters, uh, and also basically changing the kinds of uh, rules of engagement almost in the way in which the Israelis operated. So their failure to insert rules of engagement, the laws of armed conflict, into this particular targeting process resulted in this major, major catastrophe. And this catastrophe 
basically uh, shows up as a possible violation of the laws of armed conflict, as well as international humanitarian law, which demands that a country uh, that is engaged in combat protect aid workers, protect aid convoys, uh, prevent people from starving, uh, all of those kinds of things that really become important from a humanitarian perspective uh, can really be part of a major issue if they're not taken care of, both from an AI perspective as well as from a machine learning perspective. So these are the kinds of areas where, in this particular situation, an automated process went haywire, and that automated process then resulted in not only major political problems for Israel, but also in major issues uh, for the victims of this attack. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Vijay now so that he can give, deep, dive deeper into the whole cyber aspect of AI and what it means for your enterprise. Vijay? Thank you, Cedric. I think it's a perfect segue as we are feverishly recovering, most of us at least, from the world of CrowdStrike uh, let's just call it misconfiguration. <laughs> so if you really think about this, uh, we were having an internal discussion here. Um, I think I would classify CrowdStrike as a supply chain attack. You know, CrowdStrike is your supplier of threat intelligence. In this case, there was a configuration file that was sent across that was inaccurate, that resulted in some catastrophic failure. Now let's paint a, an interesting picture what if you have algorithms globally automating this type of issue across multiple software verticals at the same time? We are probably at a true AI warfare, right, at that point. If you really think about what happened, every news outlet is dubbing CrowdStrike issue as the largest IT issue. But if you were to have every automated attack vector leverage a very simple concept of sending out erroneous files, configuration files, we will seriously have some disastrous supply chain attack of scale that we could possibly not practically fathom. I mean, if you have to manually touch every one of the devices. Setting that stage, what I wanted to do today, transitioning from some of the key topics here, let's uh, drill down a little bit further into the gen AI exploits, the AI exploits, especially around the generative AI. Cedric kind of captured uh, the four key dimensions of what can be done within the kinetic warfare perspective of AI. Let's look at the misuse of the speed of innovation. What does it really mean? Let's take apart some of the motivation strategies involved. Let's also talk about shadow AI. Uh, shadow AI is the next iteration of shadow IT and beyond. Everyone is familiar with shadow IT, but let's uh, understand what shadow AI really means and how it's actually impacting you right now. Let's also talk a little bit on the enterprise side about Microsoft Copilot, which is uh, a great, uh, I would say, an augmentation tool. It helps you get a lot of things done. But there are some footnotes that we need to understand. Uh, so let's get ready, let's set, but wait for a second about that. And then lastly, this is an interesting topic, fake data breaches. What does it really mean and what's really happening here, right? Now, before we jump into this conversation, uh, if, you, if you think about the traditional cybersecurity attacks, late 2000s onward, where cybersecurity beca became a real imperative across the board, uh, the primary modus operandi involved around perimeter protection, defending malware issues. Typically, organizations evolved over a period of time to understand that the software security problems and software application security became the next dimension of it. But if you really compare the traditional IT security, information technology security components and what we are dealing with today, uh, Today's approach is completely automated. It's machine-based. There were discrete components that were earlier part of the previous generation of attacks. But if you look at software and hardware attacks that can post a constant threat to the business as it exists today, uh, the, the model has changed. Your essential core model right now uh, involves using advanced machine learning algorithms to essentially identify vulnerabilities predict pattern and exploit the weakness 
as the configuration of the system and the network and the context of the environment changes. So the efficiency and the rapid data analysis that these hackers, modern hackers are leveraging, gives them a tactical advantage, which leads to rapid intrusion and destruction. So we all know the bad guys need to do it, get it right only once. And they also need to get it right once within a short span of window. If we shrink the window even further and you tighten the attack surface, AI-based machine learning attacks in this case needs to be that much more quicker. So traditional cybersecurity methods are really no longer applicable. They are not sufficient to combat these sophisticated attacks. So how do we go about solving this issue, right? Well, we are just in the beginning phases. We are really trying to understand the dimensions of how do we even approach this. The challenge, the good and the bad news is this. AI development within the past one year, uh, one recent study shows 63,000 new patents have been issued just in the development of newer algorithm models, 62,000. This is not including the tools, the sub tools that are created based on the core LLM model. So what's really happening here is there is an exponential growth phase in terms of the development and the innovation but this is done at a cost of inherently building certain uh, challenges. In other words, building risk-based scenarios within the core gen AI model. Now, we are specifically talking about generative AI in this example. This is a paper from Google DeepMind and a couple of other industry researchers that work together over a period of time. And this research is particularly interesting as I, uh, as Cyphorix, we just started working with a large organization, a global enterprise organization, where the focus has been to develop an AI charter. And when we looked at some of the existing data exploits that are already being carried on by various AI uh, groups, internal AI groups, and how their system is being compromised and there is no tool to actually detect it. Now, if you take a step back, the most common interpretation of tools, techniques, and procedures is generally around governance, risk, and control, GRC. Now, GRC would work great, but if you look at the screen here on the left, you can see the various misuse tactics exploiting generative AI. For example, if you look at a realistic depiction of human likeness, one key example would be impersonation attacks. In this scenario, uh, the impersonation attack typically involves assumption of identity of a real person and then take fake actions or actions on their behalf. In other words, the identity is being compromised. Now, if you remember, there was an incident involving President Biden where fake robocalls impersonate uh, President Biden in an apparent attempt to suppress votes in New Hampshire. Now, this was actually done using a Gen AI technology where uh, President Biden's voice was actually impersonated. Now, you have something called as appropriated likeness. Uh, in this scenario, what happens is an, a person's likeness is altered our other identifying features are appropriated. It's not exactly the same definition, but it's slightly different. So if you think about uh, a good example here that I was able to locate is the photos of detained uh, protesting Indian wrestlers, they were actually altered to make them look like they were smiling when in fact they were in pain. So th this, is, this is a slight alteration. And going back to what Cedric was covering earlier, uh, AI can also be used extensively right now, as we know, in the previous election cycle, we saw quite a bit of disinformation campaign. Now, couple the existing knowledge and know-how of disinformation, the traditional methods, tools, and techniques with the modern approach of appropriated likeness, impersonation, and you bring in gen AI, generative AI for additional vectors you now have a very fertile battleground for a brand new level, the next level of actual interruption, actual uh, civic discourse being interrupted, that there's so much catastrophic outcome that would come out of this. For example, if you look at a concept called sock puppeting, 
this is where you create synthetic identities and these synthetic personas essentially act as if they are human beings. For example, a form of synthetic identities will typically act on behalf or engage on behalf of a particular politician or some tweet message or a post message, and then they ramp up the noise level for that particular message and uh, what needs to be over amplified. And you really start seeing massive issues because of that case in point. Uh, an army of fake social media accounts uh, which defended UAE presidency and the climate summit. Now, there's a whole lot of details around this, but if you really think about this, uh, it, it's basically suppression of reality with fake social media accounts. Now, you have non-consensual uh, intimate imagery, which is NCII, and you also have child sexual abuse material. Again, these are there are clear examples of these type of attacks already in production. You have deep fake um, uh, CSAM material being produced. There are also applications that can be downloaded from certain app stores that generally allow you to do this very easily. So this kind of tilts the entire conversation and, and kind of blurs the line between what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, and there's also a huge gap in governance. Now, if you think about traditional governance and risk, you would intend to put certain controls within the core training model. Now, there is a concept called jailbreaking, uh, which Cedric briefly touched upon. Jailbreaking is the concept of taking a trained model and removing those speed governors or performance governors. In other words, you remove all the control points that you build into your AI model. It becomes a jailbroken system, so you can command your it and essentially make it do anything. So you could take an excellent performant model like a Llama or one of the open source models, which would be actually trained with filters so that it doesn't produce adult content as an example. But by jailbreaking it and basically retraining or uptraining the existing model, you can make that model actually produce content that is not legitimate or it's illegal in its nature. Now, if you think about a realistic depiction of non-humans, which is another category of uh, tactics, this is falsification. You can fabricate or falsely represent evidence, including reports, identities, and documents. Now, we saw this couple of instances, and there is multiple examples, AI-generated images being shared in relation to Israel-Hamas conflict. We also saw doctored images that continues to come out of the Ukraine war, uh, Ukraine-Russia warfare. So there's quite a bit of falsification that's beginning to happen that goes into the, the mainstream of the social media feed reel, and that feed reel starts amplifying itself. Uh, we, are, we are quite familiar with the intellectual property infringement, uh, use a person's IP without their permission. Uh, essentially, books have been written using chat GPT at this point. And if you really dig into it, this chat GPT content is, is, is essentially harvested from whatever trained material is available, and then the book uh, content that is produced. I mean, you can end up writing a book in a couple of hours, but the content of the book could be completely different. We will talk about this a little bit more on the enterprise viewpoint of this, especially with Microsoft Copilot uh, in a couple of slides down. Uh, what I found interesting is um, content generated uh, can open you up for lawsuits, and we will talk about that a little bit further. Now, one of the other things we have seen is counterfeit, which is reproduce or imitate an original work. And we have seen fraudulent copycats, uh, BARD and ChatGPT appear offline, which essentially is uh, similar to jailbreak. So you take an existing model, you train it, you make it do certain things that the traditional ChatGPT controls wouldn't allow you to do, so we're beginning to see counterfeit AI models that's available for download. Uh, you also have abuse and use of generated content, which is a good example here would be scaling and amplification, which we just spoke a little bit while ago. Automation, amplification, scale of workflows. Essentially, you could, uh, you know, one of the key examples we noticed was researchers were using GPT-3 to mass email state legislatures uh, signaling, uh, you know, AI-generated emails and the and the 
effect of uh, AI generated emails. So, sorry, just getting a team message here. Sorry about that. Um, so, if you think about uh, what the scaling and amplification can really do, is the frequency and the amount of damage a series of emails can cause within a short amount of time. Uh, Today, we are probably seeing automated emails come through. We are seeing canvassing emails, scope emails. These are simple, I would call it, you know, grade one, grade two level operational spam email. But what if you basically elevate the capability of these emails in real time based on the context that you're able to pick up as the email is making its way through? So this is real time scaling and amplification. And then finally, uh, one of the other things you're noticing, um, similar to what these researchers have been tracking here, is targeting and personalization. Uh, refined outputs to target individual with tailored attacks. Now, this is where Cyphorix and our sensors are doing quite a bit of uh, interesting analysis. We have been doing some telemetry-based evidence analysis to understand how can attacks be more tailored. In other words, uh, we know of spam, uh, uh, spam phishing, or we targeted user attacks of executives, but what if this can be done at a larger scale? What if you actually create personas of human beings based on their social context, their social media, and then you understand their pattern, and a system is able to generate specific attack patterns purely based on their individual choices? right from the choice of you know what they order from amazon what they are able to you know do with their shopping what type of credit card they use you can model quite a bit of these and there are a couple of examples already beginning to take shape and the next level of ai based cyber attack protection needs to be completely at a different level of operations now we'll dig a little bit deeper into that particular conversation here now, on the, on the Sankey diagram that you see on the right side of your screen here, this kind of breaks down the top strategies associated with each misuse goal. So we kind of looked at what are the different misuse goal like scam and fraud, opinion manipulation, harassment, but how do you map it back to a strategy, right? This is what's important from a defender, an AI defender perspective to understand what is the relationship between the various attack strategies and how each of the objectives or the goals are being misused. For example, if you look at uh, what does it take to actually uh, drive terrorism and extremism, it's propaganda. So amplification could be another associated element so in order to respond to emerging concepts or strategies of AI-based attacks, we need to understand not just the traditional tools, tools, techniques, and procedures, but we also need to understand the misuse goal and the context behind why it's being done. Now, let's go a little bit further here. This one talks about misuse tactics. Uh, essentially, you know, if you look at the model integrity, the ways to break the integrity of a specific Gen AI model, you could do prompt injection, adversarial input, jailbreaking, model diversion, extraction, stenography, poisoning, which Cedric briefly touched upon. And then from a data integrity perspective, again, there are two different components. The model itself is a neural element, which is essentially the core neural engine that, that drives the AI. And data is something that we pass into the engine itself. So the data integrity could be the privacy and the privacy compromise and the data exfiltration. Now, I'll touch on, uh, there's a link for this white paper if you all wanna really uh, dig in uh, to, to, to understand this a little bit further, but I'll touch on model diversion. The model diversion is particularly both interesting and dangerous. We came across a recent issue where, let's just say, enthusiastic AI researchers within an organization were able to take a vision AI system, essentially an AI system that's, that was targeted for vision-based training. So it would detect certain 
elements, certain personas by using image identification techniques. That was actually taken and it was basically diverted to do something else, repurpose a pre-trained model to deviate from its intended purpose. This, I think, is the most common enterprise thought attack that we are beginning to see. Our attack is probably not the correct way of framing it. It's an interest within the researcher group. It's an interest within the enthusiast group. But the way you implement it, you're actually eliminating some of the inbuilt controls that are being put within the model. So that's a huge problem. So how do we go about navigating all of these pieces? Well, for starters, this is a long journey. For now, we have identified model integrity parameters. And then in the previous slide, we saw the different misuse goals. So between the goals, the integrity parameters, and the data control, data, by the way, sits outside. So you need to have your standard data loss prevention, data classification, we will go through all of those in the uh, slides that are coming up, but it needs to be a combination activity. Now, taking a step back, this is all not bad news, right? You know, it, there's always two sides to the coin. It's the in and the yang. We are beginning to see how the bad actors are embracing the capabilities of Gen AI much more quickly than how quickly it's being implemented with controls. Now, European Union, NISDs, uh, we have few of evolving AI frameworks. There's a lot of strategic big picture vision goals being painted across the policymakers desk, but nothing that is really gaining traction as quickly as how the bad actors are able to implement some of these strategies very quickly. Simply put, we are back at the same problem. Bad actors don't have any remorse. They don't have any control grid to basically say this cannot be done. They can execute it, they can push the button. So with the open source availability of a lot of these AI models, we now have a classic conundrum. The open source model can also be abused, which is what we are beginning to see. Let's talk about that for a second. What is shadow AI? Now, shadow IT would be your traditional, you know, a user either inadvertently or knowledgeably decides to bring a gaming laptop that is not a company issued laptop or a personal laptop, plugs it into the device, into the production network. You treat that IT asset or technology asset as a shadow IT equipment. Now, if you graduate to the data side of it, if you were to access, simple example, if you were to access your personal home stuff or your shopping stuff, that could be considered shadow IT, but that's got more to do with the data side of it. So to simplify this, shadow AI is the unauthorized use or implementation of AI that is actually not controlled or visible to an organization, technology and security department. In other words, uh, the N number of chat gpt like application that you download install on your endpoints and your mobile device they're all shadow ai you're essentially passing data into the system and those data that you're processing it could also be your own internal company data and that company data could be sitting in a common publicly accessible data want to know how that happened well here is an example if you look at the bottom from a data protection perspective, uh, Samsung embedded engineers in the chip fabrication unit essentially loaded some of uh, some IP of their Exonus chip into ChatGPT. And this was not a custom version or a private version of ChatGPT. This was a public version. And that actually exposed some of the sensitive information that Samsung did not like. So this was basically engineers trying to get some help for embedded coding for chip level design. And while ChatGPT can do great job in terms of you know, helping with your coding problems, the data exposure was quite expensive. Now, there's also another interesting case in New York uh, information integrity perspective. This happened with attorneys, two attorneys presenting uh, a basic case study, which was generated by ChatGPT, well, it, it was hallucinated by ChatGPT in the court of law, and it was actually 
uh, they, they, both the attorneys were fined five thousand dollars or so uh, for presenting uh, case notes that were not a real case. So this was done obviously inadvertently, and the attorneys who said they actually assume ChatGPT is a more advanced search engine, and they really didn't contextualize what ChatGPT really does. So shadow AI from an average user who is very curious about ChatGPT, they really want to get their you know emails done much better. They really don't see the data exposure and the information integrity problems, and they expose your company data your data boundary around your organization needs to be well-structured. So the final difference to break it down, shadow ID hardware code and data risk can be managed with well-tested ITAM, IT asset management, standard encryption keys, STLC policies, and so forth. But AI process involves models that are non-deterministic in nature, which you really can't secure right away. So there's very few uh, I would say qualified policies and procedures that I have seen when I do an initial AI audit at some of the organization. So one of the first things to get started from a CISO perspective is I'm sure there's a lot of data security policy, AI policy being put in place, but actually putting teeth to those policies by looking at specific use cases that mean something to your business operation. Now let's go a little bit further and go into the enterprise side. Now we kind of saw the market viewpoint of it, the global side of it, and then you know we kind of drilled it a little bit down after we understood the taxonomy of misuse. Then we kind of saw what shadow AI is. Now let's go to the big bang. Copilot, fantastic product, right? We use it across your modern work experience, which is your Bing chat enterprise, your Bing uh, Microsoft 365, your Windows, that is your operating system. Essentially, Copilot is an AI-powered tool. It uses a large language model that Microsoft has developed in collaboration with uh, OpenAI. And organizations did, and it leverages both the trained data and the organization's data to provide real-time assistance within the ecosystem of Microsoft application. A couple of key points. It's the general trained data and your organization's own data. Uh, there are a couple of terms that may not be familiar to everybody. It's called the data boundary, and then it's your service boundary. So your service boundary is your cloud service, and what is the, the uh, boundary that basically prevents data from leaking outside that particular element or that perimeter. So that's your service boundary. Then your data boundaries, how does data sit within the service boundary and how essentially do you manage it? Well, you need your right level of identity and access management. So your identity boundary becomes the next piece. So the good news, Microsoft has kind of evolved on its position over a period of time after a couple of lawsuits came about since Azure AI, or if, you, if you're using CloudPilot, and some of the content that was generated out of Copilot essentially was infringement of IP from some other organization. So what that led to is litigation against some of the consumers of Copilot. So Microsoft stepped up and came up with this interesting concept where it does something, uh, what, it, what Microsoft calls as customer copyright commitment. It's a pretty long document. Uh, there's a link at the bottom. You can also do a quick search. But the thesis of this is by extending the commitment to cover the outputs from Azure OpenAI service, Microsoft is essentially broadening the commitment to different customers and pay for any adverse judgments if they are sued for copyright infringement. But there is a catch. For that to work, Microsoft has certain key conditions. There are certain mitigation controls. There are certain guidelines, best practices that you need to follow. What are those best practices? Well, define your data boundary, define your identity boundary, enable data classification across the board. And let's say, for example, you're using um, Microsoft Copilot for GitHub. There are certain configurations that needs to be done 
in order for this customer copyright commitment to in fact be in your favor. So it's just not turning on Microsoft Copilot in your enterprise tenant, but it's actually getting prepared for your AI hub. Microsoft does offer an AI hub. So get into the AI hub if you're if you're using Microsoft platform that is. Uh, similar to the Copilot, there is Gemini on the Google side. Same concept exists there as well from a consumption perspective. Again, prepare your organization to actually start using AI technologies like Copilot effectively without disrupting your core data segments. Now, data classification is something that most of us have been doing from the moment we wanted to move to the cloud. But a lot of organization may have policies enabled, but are they really clearly identifying? Are they able to map and tell Copilot, for example, what data classification elements are actually usable by Copilot? That's level of definition we are talking about. Microsoft offers a product, I believe, called Microsoft Purview. Uh, that is a concept called Microsoft Purview uh, File Management Permissions, or MPIP. Now, what this does is, if a particular, let's say the CFO of the organization is working on a mergers and acquisition deal, it's a sensitive piece of document. That document needs to be limited only to the CFO and the assigned group of users. From a purview, Microsoft purview perspective, there are certain identity boundaries that can access the data. Now, in the first iteration of Copilot, when we, when we looked at it from an enterprise scale, all data within the Microsoft data fabric of your organization is game for training. So in other words, maybe I'm an analyst, a finance analyst who shouldn't know what's happening on the CFO's desk, but because the AI system is looking at all of the data, I could be getting glimpses of the M&A activity that's going on, not directly, but from some inference. So, but with the new purview model, and how you need to define the identity boundaries, you can actually enforce Copilot to use only specific levels of information. In other words, Copilot can now honor the file identity privileges, metadata control, all of these are now supported. It's a very broad exercise. We try to condense this down in about five to six minutes here. But if you are choosing to roll out Copilot or any type of AI solution within the enterprise, you probably need to go through a pretty detailed exercise in classifying your core data, your identity boundary, your service boundary, and figuring out how to map all of these into operation. Now, lastly, let's talk about an interesting topic, fake data breaches. Uh, Europe car, it basically uh, discovered a hacker selling info on its 50 million customers in the dark web. Now, initial investigations, there was a lot of alarm, there was a lot of concern, but after investigations were done, it was identified that all of these data was completely doctored, possibly using generative AI. Remember we spoke about synthetic earlier? This is exactly the use case of creating synthetic identities and the reason for this is a couple of different layers, right? The same thing happened with uh, Mogliovich, which is an up and coming Russian hacking group. They basically announced they had hacked Epic Games, but Epic Games basically found zero evidence of this claim. What's funny is this hacker group later on acknowledged that they made the whole story up but they also basically fessed up saying they did it just for the recognition in order to compete in this market. Now, if you dig a little bit deeper, there are some more elements of this that we need to think about, right? One is creating distractions. Why would I go about doing this? Now, if I put my the attacker hat on, if I create a distraction, it's a very common battlefield tactic, right? Preoccupy your opponent, and then you can attack them from a different direction. That's your standard distraction. So this could be used as a distraction. You start off with a fake data breach, but you're actually tying up the resources. You're, you're making Epic Games bring in their cybersecurity team, their external service providers. They're exhaustively examining a fake data breach that didn't happen. As they're doing it, 
you have gained attention and you're doing something else. Number two, destroying your reputation. Cyber criminals can inflict damage to a company's reputation without even having to steal the data. Why? Manipulation of stock prices. For publicly traded companies, you could, the, the attackers could be making millions without even actually creating a cyber attack or stealing your data. And lastly, most of them do this from uncovering the defenses. So essentially, when a, a concept like this is introduced, your cyber criminals can use this as a pretext to understand the type of security controls the organization has. So this is another form of recon, especially if you want to test the waters on the level of security that's available. So fake data breachers is the next iteration of attractions that are beginning to show up in our doorstep. So as a CISO, working with multiple CISOs and CIOs, this is a, a brand new concerning problem that we are beginning to see that's, big, that's taking shape in large scale. Now, if you look at the generative AI, uh, synthetic identity generation, data generation, I wouldn't be too surprised if there are capabilities or if there are data sets that are being produced for each different business type. For example, a financial industry could have a certain type of data set, manufacturing a different type of data set. So these data sets are actually, you can actually produce it yourself using generative AI platform. Now, is there, is there something that you can do really quick? There are a couple of options. One thing that has worked for me a couple of times, and I'm doing this right now with an engagement as we notice something like this happen. Everyone is familiar with Honeypot. Honeypot is the concept of introducing a network layer technology where you basically run a piece of hardware, then you let the attacker come in and Honeypot detects it, you get notified. Works great, but the problem is honeypots don't scale really well uh, in the cloud environment. So there's a concept called canary tokens. So essentially, these are simple webhook tokens that you publish, and these canary tokens are embedded within, uh, you know, a Docker application, a container, all across your environment. And the only communication these tokens need is your DNS. So essentially. It's encrypted DNS traffic, and the DNS server gets it. This particular abstraction layer decrypts that particular DNS token and tells you what exactly triggered that particular activity. So one way of detecting a possible data breach across your data estate, your cloud estate, is using canary tokens or your custom version of tokens in order to quickly discern if that is truly a data breach. You could also be seeding data so if you want to quickly check from the deep web, if your data set has actually been compromised and sold, you can probably sample some of the data to see if there are markers that you're already putting inside your data. There's a couple of things that seems to be working for us right now. But Cedric and I have been uh, doing quite a bit of research, especially within this space, on uh, detecting true AI attacks and how do we start preparing for true AI warfare that's right upon us. On that note, thank you very much for dialing in today. I will turn it back to Tom. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, as always, uh, great information, always a little bit scary. Um, and now we have to worry about fake data breaches. That's just another, uh, I guess, innovative uh, form of attack, right? So uh, thank you, guys. Uh, that brings us to the end of our time together with them, unfortunately. Um, so I, I'm going to let you guys know we're, we're going to have the guys back uh, next quarter, uh, as always, with uh, another debriefing. Uh, we're actually working on another series with them. Um, I'll just kind of put a little bug in your ear a little bit about it. It's going to be basically something, something around the modern CISO. So something for uh, modern CISOs to be thinking about. Uh, we're going to have that probably coming out in October. So check for news on that uh, soon-ish. Uh, but this concludes our uh, cyber debrief on artificial intelligence. We will see you at uh, the next round of sessions, everybody. Thank you.